a lot of my work's not fundamental. So it'll be a screen or it'll be a platform like a suspended ceiling or it'll be an applied text onto an existing sheet of glass or it'll be in the form of signage. I use the technology of signage. So, and if you look at the materials, I use a lot of aluminium and plexiglass, things that are the materials both of McDonald's sign and of like the a riot shield, a policeman's riot shield. I think a lot of the work has this mixture of, um, uh, it has a, a dynamic contradiction at the heart of the work, which is on one level quite an earnest desire to expand, uh, like Rauschenberg used to talk about, find brief, like small um, gaps in the culture and open them up for research and thereby using research methodology to do that, mixed with a legacy of what you could call refusal which is once you get in the position to do something, you don't necessarily do what would seem to be the logical thing to do. And of course, in developed, enlightened postmodernism, the logical thing to do is to show back to the dominant culture that which it has done. I didn't come from a background where I wanted to do art. I came from a background where I wanted to do something very concrete in, for the labor movement, to work for the labor movement. And this very earnest kind of to do that thing that working class people or people from working class background often want to do, which is given the chance to education, you then use that to make up for the hurt, the perceived hurt that you feel that your four fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers had. So that was my idea. And I actually went to art school because they uh, canceled my course. So I thought I'd go to art school for a while and see what happens and I'll cut, kill time that way. And I was very struck by the, um, I was very struck by this idea of cultural permission at art school that you could enter into kind of deluded and distracted structures without having to have the cultural permission you might need elsewhere. So the group of people I was at college with, like Damien Hurst and Gary Hume, Sarah Lucas, we decided to have a conspiracy and one of the conspiracies was we would all become artists. And that was a clear moment of, um, that's an absolute quantifiable thing. Yet we all completely disagreed. So <clears throat> there's some sense in which I'm from the same generation as those people, but I was never, I never really understood what their work was about. Uh, I went very quickly to Germany and France to see if I could find some other people who didn't actually have any work. You know, I didn't have any ideas, so, but I didn't want to leave the culture to other people. And this is a very, this is a thing that I think made it very interesting for me to come to New York in the early 90s when I met a lot of other people who didn't actually have any work or didn't produce anything, but also didn't want to leave the culture to other people. And I think this is a very interesting um, uh, starting point often. Um, and, and when I do this kind of sub-teaching thing, I end up trying to talk to people about the possibility of what you do is if you don't have any ideas, but you still want to be an artist. Because I think this is a very interesting thing. And there's a strong pressure to be pragmatic in that environment, like to do something else, like to channel your creativity into something that you can do until you've got some ideas. But in fact, what I did and what a lot of people did who left Goldsmiths at that time was decided whatever they would do to pass the time would be their work. So when I was rewriting these German research papers or going to events that I've been told would be news, okay, there's some connection to conceptual art there that, and things people have done in the past, but also partly it was just what I was doing to not be bored. And um, that then became the work. So this was a very, maybe you have to rediscover what people had discovered 20 years before sometimes, but I was not doing it for the same reasons that like high conceptual artists are doing it often, which was there was no necessary pointed critique of art within the act of doing it. And then the group of people I ended up working with much more were another, were a kind of mongrel, could you say mongrel or like promiscuous mongrel group of people. We found ways to work together and a lot of it was to do with not trusting cultural situations where artists you're, are telling you what you already know and it's about things being slightly out of focus, things being about hanging around, things being about um, trying to find those aspects in the culture that are hard to grasp in a way. They're like the sparkles or like the, the, um, the after effect, the, the feeling of like the glow you get of the light in a nightclub the morning after or the, you know, they're not necessarily purely romantic, but they're 
they're to do with um, standing outside a, 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 a bar or something like that. Those kind of feelings that, that are not, they're like a profound. Like if you talk about people being amoral, there's a lot of aspects of my work that are a profound. They're kind of profound and they're kind of not profound simultaneously, but they, they reach this kind of a profound situation where, where the biggest accusation you can often make and the thing that makes me most touchy about the work is when people have, a, have try to address this profundity thing, like where's the profound bit in the work? And, you know, the accusation would be, well, it's, I, I guess the idea is it's a profound. It's like, it's sort of, um, it's floating somehow. What I do, what I do find very interesting about um, the two great republics that I like to operate in France and America is to have absolutely the opposite reactions to the work, one which are cultural cliches. One is uh, often a kind of positive response without because they don't know why. I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people I, they don't they can't quite put their finger on what they might like about the work, but. They want to just communicate the fact that they quite they think they maybe like it and they think maybe they don't understand it, but that doesn't matter. And then in the French environment, again, I'm talking about the enlightened bourgeoisie, the response will be often, I understand everything and I will tolerate this structure in order to, in a way, pay you to continue doing the work that I know you really are secretly doing. So the idea being that I'm actually involved in a different job of work than appears to be the case. I've worked a little bit with, with architects and other people who operate just alongside art. And one of the reasons I've done this is very deliberate, but it, I'd never sought anyone out. What I did is I tried to look at these um, areas just alongside art. They happen for, for various reasons. One happens because, say in the case of Dior and uh, Hedy Sleeman, what happens is that he's interested in art and the idea of an artist. So what he's doing is he's being supportive, basically. He took a completely hands-off approach. So he's like the ultimate collector that you'd always want, or the ultimate commissioning person. There's some restrictions, like here's a changing room. What are you going to do? But beyond that, whatever you say, that's what's going to get done. If it, I mean, obviously there's physics and, and, and nature to contend with. But, you know, if you wanted to fill it with mud, I guess you could fill it with mud. But he already has thought it through a bit, so he's approaching artists who might not fill it with mud or not make a simplistic commentary about the idea of having like a, 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 a fancy clothes shop somewhere. Other situations, because I wrote and dealt with and spoke quite a lot about this odd territory in between things, and I wrote a book in 97 called Big Conference Center, which was about thing, how things get decided in a post-consensus environment. Um, I think some people actually thought, well, we've got this kind of non-place and we don't know what to do, so maybe we should ask him. So that's another way. So one's like, someone's thought about art a lot and thinks they'll ask you because it'll be fun and that'll help you and it'll help them and they'll like it. The second one is the fact that people recognize they have a problem and they think you might be able to, you've thought about these problems too. And then the third one is actually laziness, that once you get asked, other people ask you. So for a while in Germany, I was being asked for every public project because they were always asking the same people. I would be as varied as doing an absolute down to the millimeter CAD drawings and 3D models and everything and samples for something in a subway station in Munich to saying to a school in Munich, I will just turn up, just give me all the money and I'll turn up and I'll see what I think of and I'll just think of something. You just have to leave for two weeks and when you come back, I'll have done something. But I'll do it on my own and you know, trust me. What's very generative for me with, with, with my, and it's a, maybe a Celtic thing with my background is that I have this perfect combination when it works well of people who claim to acknowledge the appearance of the work and what it appears to do within the culture and the people who acknowledge what does not appear within the, what does not appear to be happening. And this is extremely interesting. And opportunistic, piratical, Ironic cultures like Britain are not very good for me because um, the work is not ironic. Meaning, irony meaning, you know, that two-faced irony. You know, that kind of British two-faced irony, which is like, pleased to meet you, wanker kind of irony. 
I'm interested in the idea that you can change things. One or two people can make an enormous difference, but I'm not sure that I can, or I have the cultural permission, or I should be even trying. Some people don't know why they like the work, but they think that um, it probably has a function. And is it okay, I've been asked, is it okay to have the work hanging in the house without doing anything with it? Which, I, if you look at my work, which is a mixture of text, formal, structures and then kind of odd things that are like to make sure that you know that I know that you know what I'm doing like a big glass of seven up or something then you know there's often this ambiguity about use value and um, it, it's very interesting to me when people ask me is it okay to not use it because I'm trying to imagine what use they could put the work to anyway.